Hello everyone and welcome to a new read aloud series. In this group of videos we are going to be reading The Stupendous Dodgeball Fiasco by Janice Repka. Now this one may not be a book as many people are familiar with. You know it's not one of the classics like Roald Dahl's The Witches or Armstrong Sperry's Call It Courage or even C.S. Lewis's The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. This one was a Young Hoosier Book Award winner back in the 2007-2008 school year. And this one has a really interesting combination. Throughout this story, you're going to get to hear a little bit about what life would be like in the circus. And in the same book, learn a little bit more about the legal system. Now, I know that's not a combination you might have expected from a book with dodgeball in the title, but that's where we're going. So let's begin Janice Repka's The Stupendous Dodgeball Fiasco. You can't stuff more than six clowns into a telephone booth. 11-year-old Philip Edward Stanislaw had seen his dad try. But each time a giant shoe or rubber nose stuck out and the door wouldn't shut, why should today be any different? Welcome to the Windy Van Hooten Circus, the announcer shouted. Let the show begin. In the right ring... White-faced clowns juggling rubber chickens raced on unicycles. In the left ring, Helena's marvelous miniature horses balanced on their hind legs and hula skirts. Thrilled oohs and ahs poured through the tent, interrupted by thunderous bursts of applause. Philip yawned. He rested his head against the handle of his pooper-scooper shovel. He was standing in the exit aisle between two bleachers. If one of Helena's horses had an accident. During the show, it was his job to run to the ring, scoop up the mess, and dispose of it in a special trash can. That way she wouldn't slip. The blended smell of elephants and hot dogs made Philip's stomach ache. To take his mind off it, he daydreamed about the birthday present his dad, Leo Laffalot, had placed on the kitchen table that morning. The box was three feet long and wrapped in leftover Christmas paper turned inside out. It couldn't be new circus stills, Philip thought. They're too long. Juggling pins are too short, a megaphone is too wide, acrobat gloves are too small. There were no holes in the box, so it couldn't be a new pet for an animal act. What else could it be? He stared at a muddy spot on the ground just under the right stand. A dirty ticket stub was squashed into it. Suddenly, Philip thought of something that almost made him drop his shovel. Cameron, please come to the office. Cameron, come to the office. Cameron, if you're watching, you're needed in the office. Once he had found a muddy baseball card underneath the stands. The player on the card was holding a long wooden bat, exactly the size of the box on his kitchen table. Was it possible that for the first time his parents were giving him a gift that wasn't circus related? If only I knew how to operate a bat, he thought. I hope it comes with instructions. Since the circus never stayed in one town very long, Philip had never been to a baseball game. Because his family chose not to own a television, he'd never even seen a game. All he knew about baseball was from the card and from a poem he had read called Casey at the Bat. The poem was about a great baseball player who embarrassed himself by losing a big game. Philip did not want to embarrass himself. What I need, he thought, is to find a regular kid who can give me some tips. Philip scanned the crowded bleachers and spotted a boy wearing a New York Yankees baseball cap, just like the cap worn by the man on the card. The boy was eating cotton candy and watched freckles spray jingles with a bottle of seltzer water. Leo laughed a lot through a bucket of confetti and the boy laughed. If the boy could stay after the show, maybe he could help. Philip would have to get a message to him, though. He waved to try to get his attention, but the boy wouldn't take his eyes off the show. The clowns rolled out an old-fashioned telephone booth. The phone rang and Bobo rushed in, climbed to the top, and pinned himself against the ceiling. It rang again and freckles followed, pressing himself against Bobo. Each time it rang, another clown would enter. The acrobat clowns, Versa Vice and Vice Versa, piled in. Cuddles and jingles compressed themselves in the middle, a mass of twisted elbows and knees. Finally, Philip's dad squeezed in. He tried to yank shut the door, but his extra-large clown rump, complete with pink satin boxers, got stuck. The booth swayed, making the audience sway with it. And then, whap, it tipped over. Clowns scampered out, bowing and curtsying to the cheers. Philip searched the bleachers. Where was the boy? People shaking with laughter blocked his view. He dropped his shovel, climbed onto the bleachers, and awkwardly made his way through. Three times he had to apologize for stepping on toes, but finally he made it to where he had seen the boy. Where is he? 
Philip asked the girl with braided hair. The boy who was sitting here next to you. What boy? She eyed Philip like he was an alien. He wondered if the boy had been part of his daydream. Sit down, said a woman from behind him, trying to watch the horses. <gasps> the horses, he had forgotten. Philip glanced into the left ring. Helena held a hoop and Wonderstar jumped through, but behind them a brown blob steamed. A couple hundred children were between Philip and his shovel. Sorry, pardon me, coming through please, he said, shuffling over peanut shells and empty cups as quickly as he could. He bumped a man whose lemonade splashed down Philip's shirt. Startled by the sudden cold drizzle, Philip backed into a freckle-faced girl with a caramel apple. And smack! The gooey ball hit him in the head and stuck to his hair. Give me my apple back, the young girl demanded. She grabbed the stick and pulled. Ah! Philip cried as it pulled even tighter on his hair. The girl tried to twirl the apple out, but this only made it stick more. Hey, give her back her apple, said a teenage boy holding a bag of popcorn. Philip darted out of the way as the teen lunged for him. The popcorn flew in the air and became rain, the kernels sticking to the gooey caramel. In the left ring, Helena walked backward as Wonderstar led a dance line. Each horse's front legs balanced on the horse before it. All were unaware of the slippery landmine ahead. With a squish, Helena's foot hit the blob and skidded out from under her, and foop, she landed on her tush. Her arms flailed back into a pile of hoops, sending them flying. Wonderstar swerved and knocked over a rolling shelf loaded with props. The horses scattered as the props clattered to the ground. The, stars of star the sounds of stars and stripes forever filled the circus tent. Half the clowns chased after the horses, while the other half ran over to check on Helena. Ladies and gentlemen, the circus announcer shouted, please look to the skies for the death-defying Angela, the amazing acrobat. While the crowd diverted its attention to the high wire act, cuddles and jingles helped Helena get back to her feet. Leo sprayed her backside clean with seltzer water. She looked like a stuffed doll limp from too many washings. Philip scurried to the edge of the bleachers. He fell and did a belly flop onto the ground. Peering up, he saw Helena leading Wonderstar out of the ring. She headed straight for him. He darted under the bleachers. The smell from Helena's boots made him pinch his nose to keep from gagging. At least she doesn't see me, he thought. Then something pulled his hair. Ouch, he cried, and Wonderstar yanked out a hunk of the gooey caramel apple. You! Helena pulled Philip up by his ear. The horse balanced on her hind legs, begging for another bite. I'm out there slipping in poop, and you're down here taking a nap? I wasn't taking a nap, Philip said, trying to escape from Wonderstar's appetite. Each time he moved, the horse moved too. It looked like they were dancing. Helena grabbed Wonderstar by the bridle. Why were you hiding under the stands, she demanded. I wasn't under the stands, Philip said. I was in them. In them? During the show? Philip wanted to explain about his new bat and the boy in the baseball cap, but he doubted she would care. Helena rested a piece of caramel apple stick from Wonderstar's mouth. You're a circus boy. You don't belong in the stands with the regular folks, she reminded Philip. Philip's eyes stung. He pulled up his t-shirt and rubbed his sweaty face. A piece of popcorn stuck to the lemonade stain scratched his cheek. Your mother is going to hear about this, Helena said. Now go clean up that mess. Philip grabbed his shovel and raced out to the left ring. Why did things always go wrong for him? Tiffany the bearded lady once told him that kids from the regular world dreamed of running away to join the circus. As he scooped away the afternoon's humiliation, Philip wondered if he was the first kid who dreamed of running away from it. One way to get elephant skin soft is to use furniture soap. But no matter how much furniture soap you use, an elephant will never be a coffee table. As he hosed down Einstein the elephant after the show, Philip thought, no matter how long I live with the circus, I'll never be a circus boy. I'm tired of going to sleep in Silver City and waking up in Albuquerque, he confided to Einstein. I hate not having friends my age. It's not fair. I want to live in a regular town like a regular kid. Einstein lifted his leg and Philip squirted his belly. Do you know what the worst part is about circus life? The elephant flapped his huge ears. The way the audience looks at us. Mom and Dad don't even care. They want people to stare and laugh at them. 
Einstein raised his trunk for a drink and Philip squirted water into his mouth. Being in the circus makes you different. Being different makes you a freak. That's not the life for me. The side window to his family's trailer opened and Philip saw Helena prop it with a piece of wood. Familiar voices drifted out. Philip crept to the window to hear better. Oh, his heart's just not in it, sighed Philip's mother, Matilda, the fat lady. That's no excuse, Matilda. I can't do my act if I have to worry about slipping. He must pay attention. My Oscar could do it when he was Philip's age. Well, if Oscar can do it... Well, now don't be ridiculous, said Helena. You know Oscar gets shot from the cannon at three o'clock. He's busy preparing for that. Oscar could do it if we shot him out with a shovel in his hand, said Philip's dad. He hit a button on his neck strap and his bow tie spun. Leo, it's time you stopped clowning and took matters more seriously, Helena said. Your son is not pulling his weight. He daydreams through his chores. He'd rather read a book than stick his head in a lion's mouth. He's doing crossword puzzles when he's supposed to be practicing his juggling. His behavior is most, well, most uncircus like We'll talk to him, said Matilda softly. See that you do, said Helena. On her way out, she slammed the door to the trailer so hard it shook. Philip hid behind Einstein until Helena was gone and then inched back to the window. Do you think buying him a baby chimpanzee would help? Leo asked Matilda. We tried a pet, Matilda answered. Remember the python disaster? I still don't understand how that snake thought it could eat him. We've tried it all. Juggling lessons, the junior tuxedo, the top hat, training stilts, the purple unicycle. Hey, he was crazy about that unicycle. He hated it. Well, he rode it like the wind. That's because you clowns chased after him throwing custard pies. We were teaching him how to clown. He loved it. Is that why he fled up the rope to the trapeze artist platform and hid from you? Hey, he's a great climber. He could be an acrobat if he didn't, you know, freeze at the top. Matilda took her husband's thin, gloved hand and held it to her chubby cheek. He's unhappy here, she said. All he wants, all he's ever wanted, is to be a regular boy. But he's not a regular boy, Leo said. He's a stupendous Stanislaw. Maybe he just wasn't meant for circus life, Matilda said. That's nonsense, said Leo. We've discussed this so often. Maybe it's time we let, his make his own, let him make his own decision about what he wants to do. Send him to stay with my sister in Hardingtown. Let him get away from the circus for a while and experience what it's like to be in the real world. Leo pulled off his floppy shoes and replaced them with his bunny slippers. Uh, children don't run away from the circus. He just needs to find a way to fit in. Maybe if we send him to clown school. Outside, Philip dropped the hose. It slithered back and forth, splashing his pants. Clown school? A room full of smelly makeup, tiny tricycles, and whipped cream pies filled his head. He squeezed off the valve to the hose. Talk to him, Matilda said. We have to do something. I'll talk to him, agreed Leo. Philip heard the trailer's squeaky door. He poured lemonade-scented furniture soap onto Einstein's hide and began scrubbing with a long push broom. Whoa there, boy, you don't want to wear a hole in him. I'm sorry, Philip said. I know I shouldn't have gone into the stands during the show. He gnawed his bottom lip. Please don't make me do it, Dad. Do what? Don't make me go to clown school. I'd make a terrible clown. I don't even have a sense of humor. His dad laughed so hard he had to pinch his nose and hold his breath to regain his composure. Philip hated how hard it was to have a serious conversation with a clown. Why were you in the stands? Leo finally asked. I was trying to talk to a boy. I should have waited. It won't happen again. I promise. Einstein roared. Leo helped Philip rinse him off. When they were done, they flipped their buckets and sat. What's it like, Dad? Life outside the circus? Not as good. It's got to be better than shoveling elephant pens. Trust me, son, it's not. How will I ever know for sure? Philip asked. You belong here. You just need to find something you're good at, that's all. And I have just the thing. Leo went into the trailer and came back with the long box. Matilda came out too. Happy 11th birthday, son, said Leo. Philip grabbed the present and tore into the wrapping paper. He lifted off the top of the box and pushed aside the tissue. A long sword shone up at him. It's a swallowing sword, Leo said. Philip gulped. You know, for a sword swallowing act, Leo added. 
Philip stared at the shiny metal. He picked it up by the handle and watched the sun glint off the sharp-looking edge. See? Leo said to Matilda. I told you he'd be crazy about it. Crazy is right, Philip thought. Just looking at the sword made his throat hurt. All the disappointments of birthdays past came rushing back. The hot coal walking kit, the red and yellow striped leotard, the purple unicycle, the snake that almost ate him. He'd been polite, said thank you, and pretended to like the circus presents. But this time his hopes had just been too high. He couldn't even force himself to smile. It was so unfair. How could he get his dad to understand he would never be a circus star? Philip jumped up and flung the sword. It sailed straight into one of the wooden posts holding up a tent and stuck fast. Wow, great throw, said Leo. We can use that in the act. I don't want to be in the act, Philip told him. What? Leo asked. Philip didn't want to hurt his dad's feelings, but he couldn't stop himself. His words poured out like clowns from a fallen phone booth. I don't want to be in the act, and I don't want to be in the circus. I tried, but I don't fit in. I want to live in a regular town like a regular kid. Let me stay with Aunt Viola and Uncle Felix. I don't know, said Leo, scratching his wig. Only for a little while, so I can figure out where I belong. Einstein stomped, demanding attention. Matilda rubbed his trunk. I'll call Viola, she told her husband. Well, now let's not rush into this, said Leo. Pennsylvania is hundreds of miles from here, and we don't even have money for a train ticket. Philip asked, if we did have the money, could I go? Well, sure, said Leo, but we don't. Yes, we do, said Philip. He ran over to the post and, using more strength than he thought he had, yanked out the sword. He put it back in the box and handed it to his dad. If you return my present, we can use the money to buy a ticket. I don't know, said Leo. Let's let him go, said Matilda. The boy is right. He needs to understand what the world is like if he's ever to find his place in it. If we make the arrangements quickly, he'll be able to start the new school year in Hardingtown. Leo shook his head. Sorry he said, pushing the box back to Philip. I didn't save the receipt. Philip sighed and reached for the box, but his mom intercepted it and handed it back to Leo. I did. She pulled the crinkled receipt out of her pocket and held it high. Einstein lifted his trunk and blew. To Philip, the sound was like a train whistle carrying him away from the circus. We'll stop there for part one. That'll be a nice place to pause for our little introductory piece. So we've been introduced to Philip Stanislaw. He is going to be our protagonist in this story. We've also met his mother, Matilda, the fat lady in the circus, and his dad, who goes by Leo laugh -a -Lot, one of the main clowns in the circus. As we could very easily tell from the first two chapters, Philip just doesn't really feel like he fits in. Everything that they've tried to do to include him in the act He's just really never felt comfortable and never really enjoyed it. So as we saw at the end of today's part, they are going to send him to stay with his Aunt Viola and Uncle Felix. Aunt Viola is his mother's sister, and then her husband, Uncle Felix, in Hardingtown, Pennsylvania. Now we don't really know much about either of those two people, his aunt and uncle, or the town, but we'll see that more as the story goes on, and we'll have to see how things work with Philip and if he's able to find a place where he feels like he fits in. But until then, I hope you join us for part two. Bye.